Okay, in this tutorial, I'm going to discuss uh, how to process data, uh, specifically in this example for a pedestrian and traffic survey that you may have completed. But more specifically, this is a general tutorial on how and why we do actually need to process data. What are the advantages of processing data? So you should start by reading this little piece of information here. That uh, the key idea is that when you've conducted field work, you generally have most of your data in a raw state, often on lots of pieces of paper. And the processing of that data is largely where you then turn that information into um, a series of tables. It could be diagrams as well um, that you could turn it into, but uh, most often, more, more often than not, in geography, especially if it is raw data with numbers, um, then you are going to be putting into table format. Why would you do this? Well, you've got some two key ideas. One of them is allowed, as soon as it's in a table, you're able to better analyze it. And I'll talk more about that in a second. And second of all, once you've got it into a table, you can then use these tables, especially if they are in spreadsheets, and I'll show you this in a second, to do some graphing or possibly to do some mapping, like a proportional symbols map. Right. Before I go into uh, the main parts of this tutorial, I'm just going to have a look at the two questions that are going to be required to answer when the tutorial is finished. The first one is um, to discuss how you process data from the pedestrian and traffic survey of the town centre. So that's really just following the outline I'm about to give you um, in a more simplified version uh, where you explore the kind of steps that you would take to put your table into a data, into a spreadsheet, and why you would do that. And the second of all, second reason is once you have got it into uh, processed into tables, what could you then do with that? So how could you present the data? And in that, you can also have to justify why you would choose that technique. So let's have a little look at processing data. The first thing that most geographers do when we process data is we create a spreadsheet. Um, and there are a range of different types of spreadsheets depending on what software you use. Um, so Microsoft have a thing called Microsoft Excel, which is a spreadsheet system that can be used to tabulate, process, and analyze data. And Google has the thing that you're seeing on your screen, which is called Google Sheets. When you tabulate data and when you process it, the first thing you want to do is get your raw numbers on your different bits of paper where you recorded it. And generally, we use the columns of the spreadsheet for each different piece of data. And the rows are used to represent different locations. OK? Now, um, what do I mean by that? Well, let's just say we have been to four different locations, or let's say five different locations in a town center. And uh, we're going to therefore call column one, or column A in this spreadsheet, our locations. And we would have a map, no doubt, that would show these five locations. And we would have numbered those locations one to five. Why do we want to number them? Just so when we come to this stage, we can actually link this data to actual places. So I know where location one is on a map in relation to the other five locations. So there's my first column, column A. It's got my uh, locations. Now this could be locations on a river, or it could be locations across an agricultural landscape or locations up a, a slope. It could be locations across a wide area, or it could be locations on a transit. So when we did a beach study at Tensmuir, this location one could have been, for example, the location closest to the sea, and location two would have been 20 meters away. The second is where we start putting our data in, processing it. So if we've done a pedestrian survey, we will have a pedestrian count for each of these locations. And that number will have been based on how long we stood at each of those locations. And we could have, for example, at location one, counted uh, 23 people. At location two, we could have counted 56. At location three, three we could have counted 146. At location four, we could have counted 120. And at location five, we could have counted 180. I don't know where those locations are because this is just an example. But these locations could be spread across a town centre in different places, or they could be on a transit line moving away from the centre of the city. Okay, It really depends on the sampling strategy and the method you are using to select your locations to gather your data. Now, because we are doing a traffic survey as well, we will have a traffic count. 
we will have conducted. And well, if we're wanting to compare traffic with pedestrians, we would have wanted to have done it at the same location at the same time. So let's just, uh, for argument's sake, say at this location, we counted 23 people and we counted 45 cars. Whatever time frame we gather that data. At location two, we had 56 cars. At location three, we had uh, 79 cars. At location four, we had uh, 40 cars. And at location five, we had 120 cars. So what have we done? We have now processed our data. So before we do anything beyond that, raw data is now being processed into a table. And this is the first level of data presentation. I might even want to put a frame around it. And I could include this raw data into a geography project that I was conducting. And I would actually encourage you to do so. Um, in your own geography projects, um, whether that is in the appendices at the back or actually where you are um, talking about your data. Now, why would is a table a valid piece of data presentation? Because it allows us to compare um, our data with each other. So I can see here we've got 23 and where the place that I've got 23, I've got 45 cars. I can see here when I've got 56, I have 56 cars. Do I get to see if there's a relationship? Not really, but I can see that the lowest place for pedestrians also was not the lowest, was the second lowest for traffic. There's the lowest. I can see that the highest pedestrian happened to be the highest vehicles. So it allows me to start doing some basic analysis of my results. Of course, the main reason to process your data is the next step it allows you to do. I mean, I could, for example, find out the average um, of these. And I could do that by selecting all these cells. And if I clicked into a cell and I wanted to find out anything, for example, the average, I could then say I want the average of those five cells. And I've highlighted it. And now I've got the average. So the average car count for location was 105. Now, that might be a useless statistic. I might not be useful to me. So I might want to know what's the maximum in my data set, what's the highest? And it's going to tell me it's the 180. I might, if I had a very big data set with thousands of locations, that's a very quick way of finding out what your highest is. So I might want to do some other things. So this little button over here is a, is a nice, simple way of getting um, information about your uh, data. And it actually allows you to do lots of other things, including statistical tests. And we'll be exploring that in other tutorials. OK. Uh, what I can also do is I can use this to find out if uh, there is some kind of relationship. And that's for the second question that you'll be asking to answer uh, what you want to think about. I've decided I'm interested to see if the number of pedestrians is influencing the traffic volume. And to do that, I'm going to want to use a scatter graph because scatter graphs are very good visual ways of determining whether there is a relationship between two variables. In this case, variable one is the pedestrian count and variable two is the traffic count. Now, actually, the order I put these in is quite important because one of these, if I'm going to do a scatter graph, one of these is going to be the independent variable and the other is going to be the dependent. And my first column should always be the independent variable. So which is the one that influences the other? So does the number of people influence the number of cars or does the number of cars influence the number of people? And you have to have a think about that, but I would suggest that actually the number of cars influences the number of people. So I'm going to want to switch these two columns. So I'm just going to highlight column B. I'm going to insert a column to the left. I'm then going to highlight column D. And I'm going to cut a column. I'm going to paste it there. Now you see it's taken away the column here and it's put it in there. What, why I've done that is when I create my scatter graph, it will put the traffic data on the x-axis and the pedestrian data on the y-axis. Now to create my scatter graph, I'm going to very simply highlight my two variables and the data that goes with each of them. And you'll notice they're all paired up. 
and I'm going to select this little insert chart over here. And it's just going to give a second. Now it's defaulted to a bar graph, and I'm not interested in a bar graph. Bar graph is a technique used for very different reasons. I'm interested in this technique down here. If I just scroll down, I'm using the column chart function. There we are. The scatter. And you'll see, because I selected traffic and pedestrian as my titles, it's already given me my labels down here and here. Okay. Each of these dots represents one of the locations. So if I click over here, that one there was the place with 40. And that is clearly site number four. Okay. Now there's a few things you would want to change in this. You would want to change the title. So that's where you click on this little menu here and change the chart title to scatter graph. Bearing, traffic, and pedestrian flows. And the other thing I'm going to want to do is put in a line of best fit. So how you put a line of best fit in is you go down to the series button and you click on it. And if you scroll down, it says trend line. Now, this brings me to the final part of today's tutorial, which is why am I uh, choosing the scatter graph in this case to process my data? So why have I selected this technique? Well, first and foremost, a scatter graph is used when you are trying to compare two variables. What I mean by that is, is one variable, the independent variable, the traffic count, influencing the number of pedestrians? So it's, we're trying to determine if there is a relationship between the number of cars in this case and the pedestrians. And that word relationship is quite important. Okay. Second reason to do a pedestrian uh, scatter graph is it will tell us how strong that relationship is, the strength, or it will not tell us, it will suggest. Now, the more of the dots that are close to the line of best fit indicate a strong relationship. If these dots were spread quite far away from this line of best fit, scattered one down here and one up here, for example, then it would suggest a weak relationship. Okay. The third reason for doing a scatter graph is it doesn't just tell us how strong it is or weak the relationship is. It tells us whether it is positive or negative or there's none at all. If the line is going diagonally up, that would suggest a positive relationship. What that means is as the traffic count goes up, the pedestrian count goes up. If the line was going in this way, down the way diagonally, it would suggest the opposite. If the pedestrian count was high in a place, the traffic count would be low. Finally, if the line was horizontal, then that would actually suggest there's no relationship at all. It's not strong, it's not positive or negative. Okay. Final reason for doing it is it allows us to identify anomalies. Now, anomalies are where one of your dots is in an odd location. It's quite far away from our line of best fit. And I would suggest looking at this graph, it's clearly this one here. This is a site with quite a low traffic count, but a high pedestrian count. Okay. And if I actually just play around with this slightly, I'm going to change this one from 120 to 200. Have a look what that does. Here we are. First of all, my lines become flatter because it's showing I've now got a weaker relationship. And that's been caused by this one anomaly. Second of all, this dot is nowhere near the line. So it's a definitely uh, an unusual result. Now, why that is important, why scatter graphs important for identifying anomalies? Because anomalies are the bits of data that don't fit the general rule. So this site is an interesting site. I would want to think about what was going on at this location. I'd want to look at some photographs or some notes I'd taken when I was out and about. Why has this place got a huge number of people in a place I wouldn't have expected a huge number of people. Okay, I would have mm -hmm. expected based on the other four sites, there not to be many people. And that's where the best analysis happens. If you can answer that question, why does this one not fit the pattern? And then you're answering a quite important question in geography. So that's why I've chosen to do a scatter graph. Now there are lots of other techniques I could have used. I could use a statistical technique, Pearson's and, and uh, 
a Pearson statistical test and a Spearman rank test would have been great to test the relationship. I could map this data using the proportional symbols map, but I've decided to go with the scatter graph. Use everything I've said to answer this particular question.